Good morning, Keystone Church. Thanks for joining us this morning. Hope that you're having a great Labor Day weekend. And I wanted to let you know that we're going to do something a little bit different this Sunday morning. We're actually going to take a break in our series, our Book of James series, which I hope you've been enjoying over this past month. And we're actually going to be focusing on something very specific this weekend. It's going to be all related to the subject of serving, specifically why we serve, how we serve, and we wanted to give everyone a chance that calls Keystone Church home, whether you attend in person or online, how you could be a part of our Serve Saturday project for the month of September. In fact, while you're watching this morning, you'll see some information on the screen. If you want more details or perhaps there's some questions that I don't answer, you could actually comment, message us directly. Someone from our team would love to follow up with you. But we're gonna be partnering with the Light of Life Rescue Mission on the north side, and our aim as a church is to provide 150 bagged lunches for individuals and families that are in need. Uh, based on some of the uh, ingredients list that you'll see here this morning, we estimate two to three dollars per bagged lunch. But as a church, we really do believe that we can not only meet 150 bagged lunches, but actually exceed that number as well. And this is something that we do consistently as a church. We just want to be a blessing in a practical way to our community. So we would love for you to help us. Um, if you're interested, September 12th through the 18th is when we're going to be assembling these lunches. And this is actually something that you can do in your home with a small group, with a group of friends, your family, and together provide these lunches. There'll be a drop-off date on Sunday morning, September 19th. That's going to happen either before or after our Sunday service, and then we'll be delivering those meals to the north side on Monday. So hope that you enjoy this message about serving and hope that you'll partner with us for our outreach project for September. And next week, we'll be back as we continue our series on the book of James. God bless. Good morning, Keystone Church. So glad that you are joining us here online. I want to welcome you wherever it is that you may be watching. And I also want to personally invite you on behalf of our family to your family. If you're ever around the Cranberry Township area or you've never had a chance to visit our church in person, Sunday mornings, 10 a.m., same time frame as our online service, we would so love to meet you, greet you, and say hello to you face to face. This morning, we're actually going to be jumping into a short message that all revolves around a value that we hold very dear. I mean, that we grip tightly as a church, and it all revolves around this concept of serving. In fact, as a church, we serve in the local community on a consistent basis. We had an incredible serve day where many churches around our nation uh, gather together one day during the summer and collectively uh, make an aim and take aim to make a difference in their city and in their region. And I'm so thankful that we have a church uh, filled with people that desire and have a heart to serve. And really what I want, and I want to get laser focused for a few minutes here on what it means to be a servant. What is serving all about? If you would, take a moment, pray with me here. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we have to get into your word as we engage online. God, help us to see your heart when it comes to serving. Jesus, you are the ultimate servant. Your heart beats for us to serve, to lay our life down the way you laid yours down. Help us to see that through your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Just so you know, here's something that serving is not. Before we even get into the scripture, serving is not a job. It's quite literally a privilege. It's not a burden. It's a joy. And serving is not about you it's all about Jesus. Because Christ literally modeled servant leadership. He said it like this in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Here's the first couple verses. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, 
came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at the right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Now you have to understand something, a little bit of the context here. The disciples, they didn't fully grasp what was about to take place. They were unaware that there was still a lot of suffering ahead of them, that the kingdom that Jesus was establishing was a heavenly kingdom and not an earthly one. And they're still kind of getting the full context of who Jesus is and what he's really there to do. It goes on to say in verse 22, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And here's what these two sons said, James and John. I just, I love their, maybe they were just being naive or maybe they were being a little bit too confident, but they said, we can. And here's what's taking place. Jesus is establishing his monarchy and James and John, they're looking for cabinet positions. They're strategically devising a plan for their own honor. They're thinking to themselves, you know what, I've walked with Jesus, I've suffered with him a little bit, I've been through quite a bit, the hard part is over. Where's my crown? Where's my recognition? Where are my accolades? I want the status, baby. If there's an earthly kingdom being established and there's some majestic reign that Jesus is about to, to bring to fruition, I mean, I want to be front and center. I want my seat at the table. In fact, my request, Jesus, I want to be sitting right next to you. Very bold. Let's go on to see what the scripture says. In verse 23, Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten, the other ten disciples, heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Pause here for a moment. The other ten disciples, they weren't so much frustrated that James and John made the request to Jesus, they were frustrated that they didn't actually think to go to Christ first. So here the other 10 guys are thinking, you got to be kidding me. James and John beat us to the punch. He, they're getting there first. They're going to have the best seats at the table around Jesus. Oh, he probably granted them everything that they wanted. And Jesus is trying to bring this thing back to the center. What is this all about? Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I think it's important to answer the question, what is a servant. What does scripture have to say about this? Well, there are many different words mentioned hundreds of times in scripture that define what a servant is. In fact, there's seven Greek words for one English word when it comes to serve. And I'm not going to go through all of those here as we communicate this message, but I do want to mention a few. And the first, and we find it here in this passage of scripture that we just read, it's translated serve as doulos, which means bond servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, your doulos, your servant. And really it's, it's speaking in the context of the scripture as a prerequisite to be a disciple for Jesus. This is how we live. It was a socioeconomic term and, and the idea that you were a bond servant Really, the relationship between the owner and the person that was serving them was almost to the effect of, I want to give everything that I am to you because you have been so good to me. It's, it's saying, Jesus, because of the way you served me, you came to this earth to die for me. I'm giving all that I am, everything to you. It's the idea of meeting other people's needs 
the way Christ met ours. Another word in the Greek is also used, diakonos, which is where we get the word deacon from, which quite literally means to be a waiter. In verse 26, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, your diakonos, your deacon. I'm trying to be focused of the, the needs of those around me. And even within the local church or even within your family, it's this idea of how can I find and meet a need? It's just, what are the needs? Where are the needs around me? And that's the person that's almost like a waiter is looking. Is there a cup I can fill? Is there a need that can be met? I mean, how many of you, when you go to a restaurant, you just, you appreciate great service? It's incredibly interesting because if you like to go out to eat or you've ever experienced poor service, you know and you remember that restaurant. Like, man, I can't believe the service was terrible. They didn't ask about us. They didn't check our water. The food was cold. The personality of the waiter or the waitress, they just seemed mean. And in our minds, we're thinking, man, how could the service be that bad? And, and how could they possibly create an atmosphere like that as a servant? Well, I believe as Christ followers, we lead the way, whether it be in our home, whether it be in our local church, where it's almost as if we should be asking ourselves, do we see the needs of others? Do we even care? Think about if you've ever walked into a store and you're there to spend money. I mean, your hard earned money. And all you want is maybe some acknowledgement from somebody that recognizes that you exist because you walked in the door ready to spend something and it's as if they don't even recognize that you're there in the room. The reality is, I hope and pray that that's not the way others get an impression of us, whether it be as a church or whether it be as just someone that says we follow Jesus. We should not only be looking and seeing the needs but how can we meet that need as well? It means, truthfully, that there is no need too small or insignificant for me to meet. And I think many almost feel like, well, what I have to contribute really isn't all that valuable. You almost take yourself out of the running when it comes to this conversation because you almost think, uh, what you have to offer isn't worth being considered. So perhaps you don't even make an effort or take the first step. You just kind of sit on the sidelines, almost as if, well, you know what? I'll serve others or I'll get out there in the community as long as I can just do that one thing that I love to do. And I'll tell you something, as a pastor, as we have people that engage with our church and want to serve and be a part of what we do on the weekend or outside of the, the four walls of our church, I hope and pray that our people that call Keystone Church home, that they can do exactly what it is that they love and that they find their sweet spot. Absolutely. However, that's not how it typically goes. Most of the time, it starts with a need and someone being willing to meet that need, whether they like it or not. And here's what I've found. Most often when I believe it really is something, a need that I believe God wants me to do, it's those times when I almost feel like, you know what, ah, somebody else can do that. It's not worth my time, it's not worth my effort. Surely somebody else can step up to the plate and serve in that capacity or in that area. And that could be the exact place that God wants to use you. I've heard a statement from a pastor years ago. And it's always stuck with me that if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. No need, no opportunity to serve is insignificant. It makes a difference. This last 
Greek word. It's huperetes. It looks like hyperetes if you write it out on a piece of paper. And it simply means under rower. And this term is found in Acts 26, 16. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant, a huperetes, and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me, talking about Christ. Now, what was an under rower? Well, when a large vessel was out in the open water at sea, the under rowers were actually producing all the momentum, all the, all the energy to make the ship, to make the boat go. The issue was they were completely unseen. In fact, no one ever saw their faces because they were in the lowest part of the ship. In other words, they were completely anonymous, unnoticed by others. And this is really speaking to the fact that when we serve others, it's not about making our name famous or saying, man, look at what I've done. Look at the effort that I put forth. No, it's about making Christ famous. It's about advancing His name and simply meeting needs. Listen, this would be as crazy as if our worship team on the weekend, right before the music started, if everybody broke out in a fight and were disputing who should be singing the first song. Well, I know I should be singing the first song because my voice is the best. Your voice ain't the best. My voice is better than yours. And all of a sudden, they start arguing. You're thinking to yourself, are you kidding? Can we not just acknowledge that everybody has a place that you could serve without having to be the center of attention? And as crazy as that happens and as crazy as that sounds, this type of drama was oftentimes breaking out in Scripture. In fact, we just read about it in Matthew with the disciples that were frustrated at James and John, which leads me to believe that if this drama broke out in the Bible, it can happen in our everyday life as well. And if we're being honest, many times, and I'll put myself in this category as well, we don't want to be in the low, unseen place. We want to be in the high, visible place. We want our name to be elevated. My pastor once said, let your confidence come from humility. That if you would just stay low in your life and be humble, the Lord will actually be the one to exalt you. A man I respect very much made this quote, said a man that stays on his face before a holy God can never fall from that place. I want you to think about that. When we stay low before the Lord. When we just say, God, I'm, I'm your servant first. This isn't about my name. This is about you, Jesus. Our hearts are humble. We're in the right place where Christ can use our lives for his good, for his kingdom. When we meet needs, He guides and directs our next steps. And I think that it, it oftentimes seems that the reason that many people feel stuck in their walk with Christ is because we just haven't started moving. We've never given God something to work with. And when we serve, when we meet a need, we're actually putting our faith into motion. We're actively pursuing what scripture asks us to do, and that means the Spirit of God can actually lead us and guide us and direct us exactly where He wants us to go. Here's a few things to remember about a servant, and then we're gonna wrap up here for this particular message. The first thing is this, a servant puts service over status. Service over status. We see this in verse 26. It says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Why is this important? Because naturally we are selfish. We are self-centered. We are thinking about numero uno all the time. It's about us, our agenda, our like, what do we, our likes, what do we want? 
And Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's living in a way where you consider everyone else above you. Jesus lived this way. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. I love that. Number two, quality of a servant leader. A servant puts character over comfort. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Serving others will build our character because serving is a sacrifice. But it brings so much joy. You know, in the beginning, it just takes some momentum. We just got to get some inertia, just start moving. And once that takes place, it's like, man, this is, I feel fulfilled. I'm full of joy. I'm making a difference. All because we were wanting to build something in our life of substance, not just simply remain comfortable. As a parent raising kids, many of you can relate to this. I am not concerned 100% of the time about my kids' comfort. I want to build their character. If it were up to my kids, man, yeah, I want to sleep in, I want to eat Cheetos, and I want to have Twinkies for dinner every night. <laughs> okay, well, that's not going to happen because we got to have a, a balanced diet. We got to have more activity. We got to get out of the house. It's not all about comfort. The Lord wants to build our character. And number three, a servant makes an eternal difference. We saw this when Jesus laid down his life for you and for me. And when we get to the end of our life, I'm convinced of this, when we're standing in front of those that we respect the most or those that knew us best and that really do love us. And perhaps when someone from our family or a friend gives a eulogy, they're gonna speak for what you meant to them, how you perhaps made a difference in their life, what you did for them in a moment where they needed a, a hug or an encouraging phone call or a conversation that they remember from when they were a kid. And, and all of a sudden, it's gonna be moments where you invested your life in someone else. That's what others are gonna remember. Sure, you may have had great accomplishments and achieved much in your life. There's nothing insignificant or wrong about that. But the reality is, what are our friends and our loved ones gonna say in those heartfelt moments when they're reflecting on our life? Listen, they're gonna talk about the sacrifices that perhaps you and I made. They're gonna talk about the times where it got hard, but you were willing to sacrifice your wants, your needs for the family or for your son or for your daughter or for your mother or for your father. What am I trying to say? Serving others makes a lasting difference. In fact, if I could even say it a little bit stronger, I would say it like this. Serving for the sake of Christ makes an eternal difference. And if I could, how I would love to end this conversation when it comes to the subject of serving. I would love to just simply pray and declare something over you as you're watching this. And my hope and my desire and my prayer as a pastor is that you would wanna serve with your life more than ever before. Here's our prayer. Lord, give me the heart of a servant. Help me to see that because Jesus came to serve me, I have great capacity to serve others. 
build in me a humility that aims to put all of the focus on Jesus and none of the attention on myself. Lord, help me to prioritize service over status, character over comfort, and recognizing that a servant makes an eternal difference. Keystone Church, those of you that are watching this weekend, thank you for joining us. We love you. If there is a way that we can serve you in any way, please comment, message us, reach out. We have a team that would love to follow up for you. We're praying for you, believe in God's best for you, Thank you for being a part of church here online. God bless.